I'm Dr. Peter Nyango. Welcome viewers to International Human Rights Law Lecture Series divided into different sections coded as IHRL. We begin with the introduction that is 001. This course is going to be dedicated to Professor Wangari Motamadai, a Kenyan born Nobel Prize winner who lived between 1940 and 2011 when she succumbed to the call of nature. Wangari Maadai stands tall in her outstanding defense for the environmental rights, the third generation of rights, the right to healthy environment. And she has been selected deliberately to stand out for this particular course. Let me give you a quick course overview. The overview is uh, beginning by saying that as demonstrated, the course is going to be presented using PowerPoint slides and under the slide you can read with me and you can follow the sections under our debate just to give it a kind of systematic approach. The education of law, of international human rights law must be structured, organized, systematic, and done in a way that is very comprehensive. And that is what I'm out to do. First and foremost, after the dedication of this lecture to Professor Wangari Madai, I would like to begin by giving an overtone of international human rights as the rapidly developing part of the public international law. And today it has actually spread out to all conversations around the public international law, the public institutions, government institutions, private institutions, but also civil society organizations, or if you wish, by extension, the international community at large. The course itself must have the following objectives. The first objective should be familiarization with the terminologies that are used for the international human rights law, the concepts behind it, the ideas, and also the history behind the human rights law. That one gives us again uh, another aspect that is the philosophy behind it, the jurisprudence behind it, but also another objective to understand the significance of international human rights law and the significance of human rights jurisprudence, justice system, and also to understand the importance of having human rights law at the global aspect in the following three levels, the international level that is micromanaged under the United Nations organizations, United Nations system, United Nations law, United Nations specialized bodies and uh, the treaty bodies and institutions and organs under uh, the charter of the United Nations, but also at the regional level. Different regions, for instance, African Union, which used to be called Organization of African Unity, but also the other regions like the European region, the European Union, the Council of Europe, the European Convention of Human Rights, but also the Organization of the American States, OAS, Mercosur in South America, 
as well as ASEAN in Asiatic continent. From the regional level, the third one, we see it in the context of the national level. Those are the domestic laws. However, still, we can only fit well when we look at this discourse academically, focusing our attention to the recommended reading materials, because law is part and parcel of the knowledge that must be backed by informed analysis, by literature, by documentations, records, and scholarly publications that inform us of certain theories of the jurisprudence and the philosophy behind international human rights law. This is good for your consumption and rapidly we need to begin in earnest by demonstrating the typology of human rights by a famous jurist, most pronounced in different conversations of, of human rights, Professor Karel Vasak, a sheikh who worked for the UNESCO and in 1979 came up with a three generational theory as a strategy to approach the knowledge of human rights law and the very understanding of human rights law. Let us again join uh, Professor Basak in this support to understand uh, the understanding of human rights, beginning with the principles adopted by the French Revolution in 1789, beginning with liberty, equality, then fraternity. So beginning with that, we start with the illustration of the first theory. That is theory number one, known as the first generation of rights, civil and political rights. This one represents liberty, liberty, freedom. And these are rights attached to individuals, individual rights. Generation number two is related to economic, social, and cultural rights. These are the so-called second generation of rights that actually spells out the concept of equality, egalité in French. In this case, humans share equal and common human rights. And in this case, it takes us again quickly to the third generation. The third generation of human rights, according to Professor Vasak, is designed around the so-called solidarity rights. These are the shared rights. Solidarity rights is what is pronounced in French, fraternité. And in this case, it shows the group or collective rights. These are rights, obviously, that spell out the shared rights, our shared commonalities, such as the shared environment, and all those areas that we appear first to be sharing. These are rights, for instance, to self-determination of the people. Second, there are rights, for instance, to... Um, let us say the economic and social uh, development, the natural resources are to be shared among humans. Then when we talk of the environmental uh, uh, natural resources, we look at the air, we share the air. We look at land, we share land but also we look at water, we share water. But all in all, these are bringing us to those rights that are considered collective or group rights, like what in Africa 
is always referred to as communal rights, things that we share in our vicinity. If you refer yourself to the African communalism, these are the community rights and uh, their rights that people share in terms of cultural heritages. Let us move on because this typology of rights can again move from the three ones that were proposed by Professor Vasak to the fourth one, but probably also the fifth category of rights. And that one is a subject for a different discussion altogether. Let's move forward to look at the elements of, the, of a theory of human rights by a writer, Amartya Sen, from India, I guess. Number one is the concern about human person as the basic processor of the basic rights. We are talking about the fundamental rights. Human rights as articulated, for instance, in the ethical discourse, creates what we call ethical demands more than proto-legal or paralegal or legal commands. Another point here that Amartya raises, raises is the fundamental freedom. When we talk about fundamental freedom, then we are talking of the very freedom that informs the basis of the fundamental basic human rights we are talking about, which of course point at the dignity of human persons, that is our humanity. Another point here is about the equality principle. Equality principle is uh, very key to our discourse as a concept of human rights insofar as equality serves the understanding of the human rights that are considered in their very nature as equal in portion, equal in proportion, equal in sizes, and equal in kinds. We cannot therefore claim that somebody has more human rights than other, or somebody has got a bigger size of human rights than another person. That is what we mean by equality of rights. And in that sense, we move to the other important concept that propels us to the holistic understanding of human rights jurisprudence, that is non-discrimination principle. And in definition, human rights emerge from this principle which forms the foundation of its development, that discrimination is not allowed in the international human rights law. And anything, any behavior, any conduct, or any policy that shall be regarded as discriminative actually is abolished. It's a violation. This is what brings us also to the question of inclusivity as opposed to exclusivity. Another concept that we want to look at here under a matter sense article mm -hmm. is framed around the concept that it is the government to be in charge of the protection and respect for human rights individual rights, group rights, and collective rights. So the human rights law, human rights law sorry, is seen as a, a legal framework that seeks to regulate the relationship between the government and citizens or the sovereign and the subjects, because this is where problems begin when governments tend to restrict the fundamental freedoms of the individuals, but also tend to oppress the individuals or maybe 
infringe on their access to enjoyment of such rights. Naturally, this one moves us to another great approach to this study. The approach to this study is about the understanding of the nature of human rights. What are they? And why are they so unique and different from other rights? The reason is, number one, they are universal. Universal means they belong to all of us. Inalienable. They cannot be removed from an individual. One should not or cannot be deprived of such rights. And that is what number two stands out to spell out. Number three is they are equal. People possess them in equal measure. Nothing more, nothing less. Number four, they are indivisible. They cannot be divided. Number five, they cannot be delegated. One cannot claim to have the human rights of his or her father or his or her mother or of his or her boss. And in this case, it moves us to item number six. They belong by right to the individuals. That is what we call by nature. They are natural rights. They are within the nature. And number seven is putting this natural aspect or the aspect that attributes to human rights as innate, inborn, and also they are intrinsic in the nature of humans, and without which the word human will not exist. And here there are allotments, there are endow endowments that individuals have nothing to do about them other than enjoyment. From uh, this approach, we can look at the characteristics of human rights. The characteristics, number one, they're abstract ideas, and there's no doubt about that. Number two, they are claims that people make. They are not awards because they cannot be given by any authority on earth, neither by the biological parents. Number three, they are entitlements, endowments. And number four, of course, what remains is to enjoy them. Let us move to fundamental questions that some authors seek to raise, such as what kind of statements human rights declarations seek to make? Is it a political statement? Is it an ethical statement? Or rather, is it a legal statement? The answer to this question, you can find it through your readings, your debates and reflections. Another question that I would like to highlight here is what makes human rights very important or significant? These are what I would call guiding questions for this course and for this material lecture. Another one is what duties and obligations do the human rights create from time to time? Because it is from here we can now understand human rights as within the legal infrastructures. It is law that gives human rights its flesh. Then it is through what forms of actions can we actually attach to human rights? And in this case, we find what is to be promoted and what is to be protected and what is to be discouraged by law. This takes us also to the consideration of the particularities in terms of the legislation or uh, government policies. And this brings us to the understanding of what is really to be highlighted 
within the constitution and within, in general, the entire municipal legal system. It is from here we can draw many questions and we seek to provide answers to every question as it comes in terms of, for instance, looking at the philosophy of human rights and the public affairs. Now, in, with this kind of understanding, I want to believe that uh, can economic and social rights so-called respond to the human rights as stated when we look at human rights as equal and also as to be respected. So these are what we want to understand in terms of reasonableness and also in, in terms of equal sharing, respect for the fundamental freedom and uh, the dignity of human beings, the worth of human be beings, the value, and also the question of avoiding every circumstance that might compromise human rights and the fundamental freedoms of individuals and groups. This brings us again to another point that we should not do without, in the sense that we can see it, for instance, at the preamble of the Charter of the United Nations of 1945. The Charter begins in earnest with the following quote, we the people of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person. This is a very weighty statement that opens this important charter that has created the United Nations Organization. From this approach, we find also that there must be some historical background, but this historical background is not free from contestations. However, still history serves as well that once upon a time, wars took place. Some of those wars have been defined as world wars. Once upon a time, humans were using other humans as means to achieve their livelihood, that is slavery. Once upon a time, there was slave trade. But do we see those things happening today? Of course we do. So they have not ended. Wars have never ended. And humans keep on maiming other humans, even destroying their livelihood. We have just woken up in the eve of 2022 with Russia attacking Ukraine against the spirit and letter of the United Nations Charter. That is a sign that we are not far from abolishing all types of behavior that would compromise human rights in the world. And that also gives us the purpose for which we need to indulge our attention into the research, the study, and the learning of the international human rights law. I'm here again to take you through another important illustration, the role of the United Nations in all this. There is fundamental and critical role of the United Nations in the development and progressive qualification of the human rights. And that is actually seen in the works of ECOSOC as one of the principal organs of the United Nations. 
ECOSOC, that is Economic and Social Council, which has created the commission, the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights that sits in Geneva. And uh, under the leadership of the Secretary General Kofi Annan, the late, Dr. Kofi Annan was behind the advancement of human rights development. And during his time in the year 2006, Human Rights Commission was changed to Human Rights Council to give it the impact expected. And the council is expected to carry out periodic review and come up with mechanisms for its enforcement and implementation around the world. This has not been so easy though. You can find a lot of information from the official website of ohchr.org. It moves me quickly to illustrate the following learning outcomes so that we get engaged quickly with our discourse. The first one is the definition of human rights law. What is international human rights law? And the definition should be already clear up in your minds. Number two, to engage with the historical background. History serves as well to remember and keep the memoir of where things started. Which road, which avenue of human rights that brought us to where we are? Was it because of the two world wars? Was it because of those horrific atrocities in history? Was it because of the time of the dictators and uh, those who could even kill and eat the flesh of their enemies? Was it the time of slave trade and the massive trafficking of humans across the Atlantic and Pacific to the other part of the world against their will? Is it about the illegitimate colonization of Africa by the European imperialists? Is it because of the extraterritoriality excuse under the pretext of civilization process and developing humans? And this one brings us to the conclusion of this presentation. But before we do that, please look at this and read it with me. Human rights can be seen as primarily ethical demands rather than looking at them primarily as legal, proto-legal, or legal or paralegal commands. And this again gives us another aspect of human rights law that human rights law engages so much with the dimension which is more of morality principle than more of deontological principle that is duty and command that is framed within the jurisprudence. Thank you for watching. And I believe that with this opening, we are going to move much better into this study. Thank you and bye for now.